welcome to the sixth season of Land Fair Live. This is one of our most exciting presentations. This is a reprisal. We gave this presentation at the United Theater last March, and uh, many of you were not in town for that, so here we go again, and you're in for a treat. I'm Deborah Lamb. I'm the chairman of the Watch Hill Conservancy, and on behalf of the board, welcome to Land Fair Live. Um, we need to thank a bunch of people on the Conservancy team. First and foremost, Janice Sassy, who's our program director and put together all of our speakers. So yes, raise a hand for Janice, please. Thank you, Janice. Um, I also want to make sure that we thank our hospitality crew. We have Morgan Anderson, Annika Mannix, Avery McClear, and Tom Papadia, who do all kinds of behind the scenes stuff and then greet you out there with wonderful treats. So thank you all for your help. <laughs> and of course we need to thank Grant Simmons, who's a longtime vice president at the Conservancy and a chef extraordinaire. And every single treat that you brought, Grant is gone, has been gone for 10 minutes, so thank you very much. They fly. Get here early if you want Grant's wonderful appetizers. Um, I also want to thank our, yes, please, raise your hands for Grant. We need your support, and we've had amazing sponsors this year to uh, help support all of the community programming that we do in this room, and we've done it elsewhere throughout Westerly. Um, I'd like to make sure that we thank tonight uh, the Bob Valenti family of dealerships, Graysale Brewery and Distillery, Michelli's Furniture, Watch Hill Garage, Lathrop Insurance, Bar Coast, Olympia Tea Room and WH2O, The Wine Store, Town Fair Tire, Watch Hill Real Estate with Jeb Masterson, The Watch Hill Yacht Club Cabana Group, Anonymous in memory of Watch Hill Pioneers Chaplin Barnes and Fred Whittemore, uh, The Lamb Family, Marianne and Brian Thompson, and we get their help for so many things, we can't thank them enough. The Alfred M. Roberts Jr. Charitable Foundation. Um, so please raise your hands for all of our uh, sponsors. <laughs> and without further ado, because we have three amazing speakers tonight and they all have beautiful slide presentations that you'll want them to linger on. I want to introduce our Napa Tree Conservation Area Manager, Daniel Cole, who has the privilege of introducing our speakers. Thank you, you Deborah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so excited to have you here tonight. Uh, like Deborah said, this is a repeat performance of just an amazing lecture that we held at the United Theater this past winter. And you are in for such a treat. We had such a great turnout that we, we definitely had to do it again. Before we move on to the presentation, I really have to give a, a big thank you to uh, the University of Rhode Island Coastal Institute. Napa Tree Point is a Coastal Institute climate response demonstration site. And the Coastal Institute uh, supports a variety of different stewardship and monitor efforts that we have out there. Um, th without their support, we would not have been able to bring you the lecture this past winter or this lecture this evening. Um, and tonight, what you're going to do is hear about how conservation areas like Napa Tree really uh, play a vital role to the yearly migration of a variety of species. And this is really perfect timing. It's almost like Janice queued us up uh, for the start of the migration season. Um, and we're starting to see the usual suspects out there that you're going to hear about tonight. And what was really interesting this past week, we had a very unusual suspect show up. This little plover showed up on Napa tree. And if you look at the range map over there with the red and blue, you'll notice this lesser sand plover doesn't really visit us that often. Uh, it was uh, definitely out of its range. And this Asian plover species can be found in Alaska, but very rarely shows up. Um, here on the east coast of the United States. Uh, this amazing picture was taken on Napa Tree on August 5th by one individual birder. 
And I think he probably thanks his lucky stars every day that he brought his camera out there because he was the only birder to see this uh, special bird that visited us. But the story of this species and the stories that you're gonna hear tonight about our migratory uh, species using Napa tree really highlight the importance of conservation areas up and down the East Coast. So thank you all for supporting the Watch Hill Conservancy. Thank you for all our partners who do great work out there um, on Napa tree and our Napa tree naturalists that really help keep the conservation area here in Westley looking beautiful and an uh, important area for a variety of conservation efforts. So tonight you are gonna hear from three experts in their field. And we are gonna start with Dr. Peter Payton. Dr. Payton is a professor and chair of the Department of Natural Resources Sciences at URI. Dr. Payton researches folks, focuses on the conservation of vertebrate, po vertebrate populations with an emphasis on coastal birds. Uh, he is a past president of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey and is a Napa Tree Point Conservation Area Scientist for Avian Conservation. After that, Dr. Peter August will follow up talking about the migration of bats. A professor emeritus in the Department of Natural Resources Science at the University of Rhode Island, Dr. August has chaired the Napa Tree Science Advisors for 12 years and is the president of the Watch Hill Conservancy. He is a landscape ecologist that uses GIS technology for conservation planning and public outreach. And finally, to wrap up this evening, Dr. David Gregg will talk about the migratory pattern of insects. Dr. Gregg is the executive director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. The Natural History Survey is an organization that connects those knowledgeable about Rhode Island's animals, plants, and natural communities with each other and with those who can use that knowledge for research, education, and conservation. Dr. Gregg holds a PhD in anthropology from Brown University. He's a senior fellow of the Coastal Institute at the University of Rhode Island and has been a leadership fellow and mentor with an initiative for nonprofit excellence. That's just a small subset of the amazing accomplishments of uh, the individuals you'll hear from tonight. So as a reminder, all three speakers will give their presentation and we'll have plenty of time for the very many questions and answers you'd like to hear from after the presentation. So, Dr. Payton, we'll take it away. Well, hi everybody. Um, I'm excited to be here, uh, talk a little bit about birds and talk about uh, Napa Tree as an international destination. So, first I'd like to poll the audience. How many of you consider yourself a year-round resident of Watch Hill? A small fraction. How many of you are migrants from the southern United States? More, about even. How many of you, how many of you are international migrants? We have some international migrants too. Where are you from? England. Who? that's a tough one for the birds to do. But we'll talk about that. So, exciting. Um, so I'm going to try and give you a different perspective on Napa tree. I really like this bird's eye view of Napa tree. I and mean, then while you're looking at this and trying to figure out where you are um, in, in the relationship to the geography. Um, so here's, here's Napa tree right here. You can see Long Island. Here's Narragansett Bay. Here's Cape Cod. Um, here's Block Island. So think about this, this land, small spit of land coming out and birds coming from all around the, the region um, to, and they, they uh, utilize Napa tree as a, as a key stop oversight. Um, so if you just, do, I'm not gonna give you a lot of numbers, mainly pictures, but I'm giving you some numbers. So there's been a little bit under a thousand species of birds recorded in the continent of the United States, okay? Of those 970 species that have been recorded in the continental United States, in Little Rhode Island, about 434, 435 species have been recorded. So about 
of the birds that are being recorded in the United States have made it to Rhode Island. So even though Rhode Island is uh, a small fraction of the United States, less than a half, per, half a percent of, in terms of land area for the United States, we get almost 50% of the species of birds recorded at, um, at Napa Tree. Then if you, within Rhode Island, remember there's about 434 species, um, depending on what bird list. So if you go to eBird, right now on eBird, you'll see 200, this, I made this slide in March, uh, there's 262 species that have been recorded on eBird. Um, and actually, Ray Larson, who many of you know, and Chris Reithel have recorded 303 species of birds in Napa Tree. So 70% of the bird species that have been detected in Rhode Island have been detected at Napa Tree. Even, even just a small area, 70% of the birds have been detected here because it's a key stopover site for a lot of migratory species. And on the right-hand side, you can see just uh, some idea of the different groups of birds that are detected in Napa Tree. So you'd expect a lot of waterfowl, lots of shorebirds, including that lesser sand plover, herons and allies, raptors, Joe Zabrowski's in the audience. He knows a lot about the raptors of, Na of Napa Tree, um, and songbirds too, about 103 species, just to give you some idea of the types of birds that show up here. So this is a talk about uh, Napa Tree as an international destination. And this is going to test your knowledge of the flags of all the countries in the world. In the world, and so maybe some of you are more astute than me about learning flags. But I'll go and ex I'm not going to tell you the answers to all these flags right now. I'm going to go through the birds and use the birds to de describe the de various countries where they come from. So a lot of you probably have looked at a bird field guide and you see a range map. And so here's the range map for osprey. Um, and showing the orange shows the breeding range and the whole Arctic, so throughout North America and South America and across Europe and Asia. And then wintering in um, southern United States, all the way down to Central, Central and South America, and then across Africa. What I want to talk about today is how do they get from their breeding grounds to, the, to their winter grounds and vice versa. And a lot previously, you could only do by banding studies, but now with a lot of technology, you can put satellite transmitters on the birds and figure out exactly how they're making those migration routes. Um, and Rob and Rob Beregard, uh, who came and talked here last year, put satellite transmitters on ospreys to really look at the detailed movements of ospreys. And what they what he's shown is kind of uh, is amazing. So if you look at where ospreys go, so they're the ospreys that are breeding in New England, they're going to go and winter in the center of. Uh, central Brazil. And this just shows the movements of the of this satellite transmitter bird. So you can see in the middle of August, it left the breeding ground and slowly made its way um, to Pennsylvania and then down the East Coast to Florida, then over to the Dominican, to Cuba and the Dominican Republic, and then the Lesser Antilles, and then eventually made it to the coast of South America. So that went from about the middle of August to the middle of October, so about two months. Then it slowly meandered, it made its way down. So by from October through January, eventually made it down to its wintering grounds. So it took about 170 days from leaving the breeding grounds to go into its wintering grounds. Um, and that's a distance of about f almost 5,000 miles. Pretty incredible, right? I get exhausted just sitting in a plane doing a flight like that. Can you imagine doing that as a migration? So it takes about 170 days. Then um, in the spring, that's typical for a lot of birds to kind of make their way down a little bit slowly to their wintering grounds. But the breeding grounds are a different story. They want to get back quickly, as quickly as possible, um, establish their territory. So it only takes that same migration distance. Um, it, only took 20, it only takes them 28 days from when they leave their wintering grounds to make it back up to New England. So we're going from Brazil back up to the breeding grounds in about less than a month. So they're, you know, they're moving, averaging about 160 miles a day, which is pretty incredible. Although I just had a daughter bike across the country and she was doing 90 miles a day on a bike, so she was doing pretty good too. Um, so that's one story. Here's another example of what we've learned based on movement. So a lot of you probably recognize American oyster catchers. Um, breeds here on Napa Tree and, and Sandy Point. 
Um, the adults in the, the right with the all orange, orange bill and the, the juvenile is one with the black tip to the bill. And they've put, they've been, uh, Maureen Durkin and others have been putting these color bands on the birds. And so you can look at the movements of these birds based on observations of these sightings of these color bands. Um, and a lot of, we thought the range map for them would be going up and down the east and east coast of North America. So the birds in Napa tree, they go down to Georgia and North Carolina during the winter months. But we, we've also based on these resightings too, we know that they also go down to Central America. And in fact, a lot of these birds are going to Nicaragua, Honduras, and El Salvador, um, where whoever designed the flags had a very, very similar mindset about how to do the flags. I never knew this till I did this, so uh, I was interested in that. Um, so a lot of these birds are going much farther south than we thought. One of the more staggering examples of migration is black pole warbler that kind of looks like a black capped chickadee. Um, and you can see that they breed throughout the spruce fir forest of northern Canada into Alaska, and they winter in Brazil and, and Venezuela. Um, what we didn't know until these little things called geolocators we could put on their legs and look at their movements of the birds um, is that what they do in the fall is they stage in New England for about a, they go from that throughout those spruce fir forests, they stage in New England. Um, they go from about 12 grams to 20 grams, so they almost double their body mass. And then they do this tremendous flight over the ocean. They go from New England down to Bermuda, the Bahamas. It takes them about two days to do that one flight. And then they stage there for four or five days. And they fly down to the coast of South America. Um, and then eventually they make their way down to um, Colombia and other areas too. Um, so they're doing, they're doing this really long distance flight over the ocean, pretty incredible for such a small bird. Not many, not many small passerines just do such a long flight over the ocean, but this is one example of it. And so they're going down to Venezuela and Brazil. One of the species that I've been studying a lot is when they're probably familiar with is piping plovers. Um, and so we put transmitters on them, and we've also put color bands on them, these flag, these flag bands. Um, so we put these miniature transmitters on them. We were really interested in their offshore movements of these plovers to see how um, offshore wind developments might, might have, if there might be a uh, potential a collision risk between plovers and offshore wind. And so the way we did this, we put these small tra transmitters, um, and there's a series of stations throughout the region that we can monitor the movements of the birds with these small VHF transmitters that weigh about a, gr a gram. And long story short is what we found is that the birds that we put these transmitters on, after they leave Rhode Island, they don't follow the coastline, they do the hypotenuse of the triangle, and so they go, they go straight from um, Rhode Island these blue lines down to New Jersey and farther south to eventually up at Cape Hatteras in North Carolina. And then birds we put transmitters on in Massachusetts for modern one, they fly, fly even farther offshore and they go all the way down to, some of them go all the way down to Cape Hatteras in one shot. So it's a, a flight of about eight to 13 hours at night. They leave right about at dusk. They're more likely to travel on nights when there's tailwinds. They take advantage of those tailwinds, and then they do this long-distance offshore flight. Um, so that before, before six or seven years ago, we couldn't really get this information until the, tr the technology get that small, got that small. And then the birds, after they go to Cape Hatteras, they stay there for about a month, molt, fatten up a little bit, and then they eventually go down, um, like a lot of you. Well, I don't know if you fatten up before you go south, but. <laughs> Um, maybe you do, I do, um, is that they make it their way down to uh, Bahamas and Turks and Caicos, if you're trying to figure out that one flag was, that's Turks and Caicos. Um, and so they spend the winter there, and then they come back uh, to breed in Rhode Island. So all the birds from New England are going down to Bahamas and Turks and Caicos. Um, and then we get the vagrants. Um, Daniel just talked about lesser sand clover. Here's two examples of uh, Terex sandpiper and redneck stint are two species that you can see normally breed uh, in Russia um, and then winter in Africa and Australia. Um, but then but they, we showed up as vagrants here in 2020. 
And the final species I'm going to talk about is Rosia tern, which is one of my favorite species. Um, they nest on Graykill Island, which is uh, about 12 miles from here, between Fishers Island and Plum Island. It's actually one of the largest tern colony, one of the largest tern colonies in eastern North America. There's about it's federally listed as endangered this species is. There's about 2,100 pairs of rosia terns on Great Gull Island. There's about 11,000 pairs of ro common terns on Great Gull Island. Um, it's only 17 acres. It's a, a spectacular place. Um, and so I've been monitoring birds there for over a decade now. So this is an adult rosia tern and it's chick. Um, and so we put transmitters on them and those plastic field readable bands. And so you can see that there, Breed um, throughout the world. There's a population of breed in the Caribbean and also here. Um, and then if you look at their movements, so after they breed at Great Gull Island, they do an interesting thing as they move north with the adults um, and their chicks. So they normally have two eggs. So the first chick that hatches is the A chick and the A chick goes with the male parent and the, and the B chick goes with the female parent. And so they leave here, they go up to Cape Cod where there's a lot of sand lands. They, they stay there for about five to six weeks, fatten up again, same old story, get used to uh, learning to fish, and then they migrate from Cape Cod straight out over the ocean down to um, Puerto Rico. Uh, and then they keep on going a little bit farther to the coast of uh, South America. And then they're gonna winter up and primarily along the coast of Brazil on the northern coast of Brazil. So that's their migration in, in the winter months too. So they're hitting Venezuela, Guiana, and Brazil are two other examples of some of the species that, that hit. So um, that just gives you some idea of some of the migratory strategies that birds exhibit for the, uh, it truly is an international destination. It's a key stopover site for lots of different species of birds. And so you're, at a spectacular place that excites me and hopefully excites you too. So anyway, thank you. Great stories, Peter. That's fantastic. And, and the really fun thing is you can go out to Napa Tree, especially on low tide, and see those cast of characters tomorrow. I, they're beautiful birds. This summer, the piping plovers were absolutely everywhere. Um, the story I'm going to tell, you're just going to have to trust me because you won't see them. Um, and that's the uh, migration of bats on Napa tree. So we started this study three or four years ago. Um, we were interested in what kind of bat fauna we would find on Napa tree. Uh, we weren't too hopeful that it would be um, a dense and diverse bat fauna because Napa tree really isn't the kind of habitat that you would expect bats to hang out in. This um, bottom picture where you have fresh water and tall forest, plenty of roosting sites, that's good habitat. Napa tree, that doesn't really look like Napa tree. However, um, in Fort Mansfield, we have all those um, caverns that they use to store munitions and um, in Rhode Island, some of the larger uh, coastal forts with a similar kind of maze of rooms where they stored the ammunition um, have ended up being pretty good bat roost. And so um, we were thinking that maybe because of the roosting uh, potential on Napa tree, we, we might um, find something. And last, as Peter has shown, um, and I'll talk to you more about this, Napa trees on the coast, and many of our migrating bats follow the coast, so we're interested to see if we see any surge of activity uh, over the year. So let me introduce you to our cast of characters, and we really have two groups of bats that I'll be talking about. One group comes under the general name, the tree bats. This is the red bat, the hoary bat, and the silver-haired bat. And the big distinguishing characteristic between the tree bats and the next group I'm going to uh, talk about is how they deal with wintertime. All of our bats eat insects. Napa tree in Rhode Island is not a good place to be in January if 
if you feed on insects. So they deal with winter one of two ways. The tree bats will fly down to the southeastern United States, spend the winter, um, as many of you do, as we've learned from Peter, in the southeast where it's warm and there's bugs out year round. And in the summertime, they'll come back up um, north where, and if you go outside these days, you will attest bugs are aplenty. Um, and so our part of the world is a terrific place to be for mosquitoes and moths and flying beetles. Uh, in the summertime, it's just not a good place um, in the wintertime. So these are our tree bats. And I would have to say these rival those beautiful oyster catchers in terms of being uh, contenders for the most handsome animals on Napa tree. Um, I'm sure David's going to give you some good competition, some good candidates for that too. But these are stunningly beautiful bats. And um, uh, red bats, you might actually see, they fly early um, in the evening. They're bright red and they fly low. And so if it's October and you see a bat flying around like along the road, it might be a red bat. And you would notice that red color. The other way bats deal with winter is to hibernate. And this group of bats, for example, the big brown bat, the little brown bat, and the tricolored bat will <clears throat> um, find a cave or a mine or sometimes a building where they can all congregate. They will spend the winter as long as the inside of the cave or the mine doesn't get you know, below freezing. That's like the perfect situation. And they sleep through winter. They go into a deep torpor um, and live for the winter months off stored body fat. And so for both our migratory species and our hibernators, just like our birds, fattening up this time of year is a very important part of the life cycle. So these two groups of bats, the tree bats and the, and the hibernators, differ in where they spend the winters. Hibernators uh, here locally in, in New England, uh, tree bats down south. Tree bats tend to roost in trees, hence the name. Bat biologists aren't very clever with their naming systems, so we call them tree bats. The hibernators will roost in old buildings like barns or hollowed out trees, uh, caves, and mines. And some of our um, uh, hibernating colonies of, of our migrators can be huge, tens of thousands of bats. Um, tree bats eat moths and beetles. Our hibernators eat moths, beetles, and mosquitoes. Uh, a very interesting characteristic for both groups is mating happens in the fall. The females will store the sperm through the winter when they ovulate in the spring, the sperm is there, and they get on with the business of being pregnant um, without having to go through the complication of mating, because they've done that in, in the fall. Because, like I said, the name of the game is to um, eat as much as you can at the end of summer to put on as much weight as you can, because that's either going to hold you in your, or in your migration or in your hibernation. And so to speed up the process, the sooner that you can have your young, um, the sooner you can wean your young, because that's a big energetic demand on, on the mother bats. And um, that allows plenty of time to fatten up. Tree bats have two to four pups. Our hibernators, one to two pups. Um, that flight down south takes its toll. Our tree bats have a lifespan of two to five years. If you're a napper, keep that up because you're adding years to your life. Our little brown bat, we have records of bats living 30 years, and we know that from banding studies. So how do we do this? Chances are, if you take a walk out in the middle of the night on Napa tree, you're not going to see a bat. They're going to be there, you're just not going to see them. So we do acoustic monitoring of bats. Um, this is a Peterson bat detector in the middle of the slide. We run an antenna up above the shrub layer on the western tip of Napa tree, which if I were a foraging bat, that's where I'd want to go. It's pretty buggy out there, trust me. And so if I were looking for mosquitoes, that's, that would be a good spot. 
And any time a bat passes within about 50 meters of that um, uh, microphone, its echolocation call will be recorded on a high density SD card inside the device. The device is powered by a little lawn tractor battery and I can get maybe three weeks of life out of it before I have to swap out batteries. So every three weeks, pull the SD card, put in a fresh one and um, change batteries. Take my SD card, download it into a computer and the computer will look at the acoustic properties of each one of those recorded calls and if it's a good quality call, it will make a de it'll make a decision on what species uh, made the call based on the uh, some pretty high end statistics on the acoustic characteristics. So the top two um, graphs and what these are, are graphs of is time on the x axis, frequency on the y axis. These are two really good bat calls: a red bat, big brown bat. And the frequency here is about 20 kilohertz. You stop hearing at 10 to 12 kilohertz. And so we could have a bat flying in this room and if you could hear its 20 kilohertz sounds, it would almost be deafening. These are really loud calls at the bats nearby, but we are unable to hear at those frequencies. So this is what, um, the computer will do and it will make a, a classified estimate of what species made the call and the probability that it's right. And all the data that I'll tell you are basically 100% correct um, uh, classifications. So I, I'll show you what we recorded last year in 2022. We had our bat detector out from April through uh, November. Um, I recorded 48,000 bat passes. Of those 48,000, 12,000 were of good enough quality to uh, determine what species. As an example of a busy night out there, um, this time of year, it's pretty hectic with bat activity. Over in Napa Tree, I had 1,400 bats passing within 50 meters of the microphone. Um, big brown bats are our most common species. The tree bats um, are next, and then tricolored bats um, uh, bring up the tail on this. I have to remind you that <clears throat> the microphone that's just above the shrub layer is recording bat passes. Now that night in August 4th could have one bat circling that 1,400 <laughs> times. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's one bat or 1,400 different bats. Um, all I know are bat passes. I'm sort of assuming that no bat is going to do laps around my microphone out in the middle of the, uh, of the shrub zone on Napa tree. And so this is what we found with big brown bats, our most common species. Very low activity in the beginning of summer, and then this time in August, it explodes with um, big brown bats passing by. And the timing is such that they're having the, and I'll review this in a second, they're having their babies in May, June. The babies have now weaned, they're starting to fly on their own, they're becoming independent, um, and the females, the, the mother bats, are now fattening up for, for hibernation. Um, and with the babies flying around, we have almost twice as many bats in the air um, with those babies. The likelihood of any one baby surviving um, the winter is very low. Um, only about 1% do. There's high mortality of baby bats in that, in that first winter because if, if they make it to the cave or mine and they're not big and fat, they're just not going to be able to uh, subsist on stored body fat over the winter. The tree bats the silver-haired bats are starting to pick up now, but what's really exciting is the only bats out there in September, October are our migratory species, the red bat and the hoary bat. And I am speculating that these are bats who are following the coast down, just like the same pattern that Dr. Payton showed us, 
following the coast down to the southeast. They're using the coast as a navigation aid. The red bats and the hoary bats occur as far north as Canada. And so um, if they are, in fact, using the, the shoreline as a migratory route, these big spikes, spikes of activity that we see in September and October are bats migrating through. So who would have thought that Napa Tree would have been such an interesting, exciting place, um, especially uh, at the end of the season? A quick summary of the life of our um, hibernators. Hibernate in the wintertime, wake up in May, leave the maternity colony, the, or leave the hibernation caver mine and fly to a maternity colony. Maternity colonies are females only, no boys allowed. So there'll be 50, 100, 200 female bats, all pregnant when they get there because um, the stored sperm thing and the ovulation in the spring. Pups are born. Uh, this time they're flying back to their uh, caves. It's the only time of year where males and females are together. They do all their mating in the fall before they go down for the winter. Um, and repeat cycle 30 times if you're a little brown bat. The um, tree bats, slightly different life cycle, winter in the southeast, commute up to the north um, in April or May. Pups are born in the summertime, up to three uh, per litter. They can head very far north. And when they do their return flight uh, in the fall, um, they mate on the fly. That's when mating happens, when they're headed back to the southeast. The females store the sperm, as do our hibernators, and um, uh, that's, that's the life cycle for our, uh, for our tree bats. So, very interesting bat fauna, actually, with a uh, very interesting natural history. So, our diversity of bats on Napa tree, pretty standard for the area. Spring and summer activity is pretty low until babies are born and weaned and things really pick up. Um, we have inspected the uh, caverns in Fort Mansfield on a number of occasions and have not seen any sign of bat roosting in there. Um, and I think the problem is, is that they don't go, they're, they're not extensive enough not to be freezing cold in the winter time. So it's not gonna be a good hibernation site. Um, and you really need to be above freezing temperatures for a hibernaculum to work. Um, but the post-breeding activity on Napa tree is spectacular. So even though you can't see it, you can celebrate all that bad activity tonight because I'm sure it's happening. So anyway, um, that's the story on bats. And now I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Dr. Greg, who will regale you with some equally exciting stories of almost as handsome animals with the insects. Thank, thanks very much, Pete. Uh, yes, I'm here uh, talking about the things that the other two groups of organisms eat. So um, uh, the, the insects are actually more important than the other two because we're, we're feeding them. So, um, and there are migratory insects on Napa tree, and I know that a lot of people know about the monarch migration, and we're certainly gonna talk about that. But there's a lot more happening with um, the insect migra migrations than just the monarchs. Uh, so first of all, I know when we think about migratory organisms on Napa tree, we think about the birds that uh, are the sort of classic, your plovers and your osprey, we've heard about already, and they, they go south in big Vs and things like that, and they're headed for a, lo a far distant place. And those birds are headed to a place. This is, I, I, I'm not a migration biologist, so I'm probably using the terms wrong, but I think about it as sort of point to point. They leave Hudson's Bay and they're headed for Argentina or something like that. And uh, this is over thousands of miles in as little as a couple of weeks. Um, and monarchs are kind of in that basket. I sort of think about them as doing this kind of point to point thing when they leave here in the south, and this is sort of the classic uh, migration for uh, monarchs. They have, most of the monarchs that head to Mexico 
are actually out of the mississippi river valley they're not actually from the east coast east coast monarchs go down the coast and they actually collect in florida they kind of get stuck in florida which is kind of a horror but some of them we do know from tagging that some of them do slip over into this group so so i know that it may be disappointing to think that it, that you're not contributing all your monarchs to the problem with the monarchs in Mexico, but some of our monarchs here are making it there. Um, and there, there are monarchs that move up and down the West Coast, and I'm not really talking about them. They, they winter in Southern California. Um, and this is the distance. It's, it's a couple of thousand miles, and they go to um, these uh, mountaintop forests in Mexico that are 10,000 feet in altitude, and they have uh, the, um, the uh, fir trees there have, uh, there's very low wind, but there's lots of humidity, and the temperatures are relatively low. So you're an insect, you're only about this big. You don't want, your, your, the real risks are dehydration, um, and so you want the, the low temperature keeps the relative humidity high, and the low wind keeps it from uh, evaporating uh, even more. And uh, these are the you know, sort of classic pictures of the um, uh, monarchs clustered in Oyamel trees in Mexico. Now, the 2,000 miles that a monarch flies, a monarch weighs just a few grams. Uh, there, you weigh as much as 100,000 monarch butterflies. They go 2,000 miles. It would be like you going 200 million miles, which, which is 18 light seconds. It's an incredibly long distance. But these butterflies do that more or less in one big, in one big jump. They get a tailwind in the fall like the birds do, and they do that jump down here to these conditions. But of course, like the birds and the bats, they stock up first um, before they make the trip. And these are pictures of the butterflies, the monarch butterflies on Napa tree, where they find lots of uh, goldenrod and um, they can get, uh, uh, there's a, a lot of um, nutritional value in um, the flowers that are here on Napa tree. So they stock up. But also, these are, these are cedars and pines on Napa tree, and the monarchs are clustering in those, and it's very much the same um, uh, instinct or reflex that they have for those trees in Mexico. These are evergreens, they have low wind speed, a lot of shelter in there, they can cluster together, they avoid predators by being together. So they're doing their monarch thing right here on Napa tree. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to maintain uh, floral diversity and to reduce invasive species. And here you can see Youth Conservation League uh, projects doing that right here um, a number of years ago. Now, like some birds make very long distance migrations, some birds make relatively short distance migrations. And these, these are juncos and looms that are essentially moving between um, an inland habitat of some kind and, and a coastal habitat uh, in the winter. And this is, I think of this more as sort of just getting to the right resource. When the lakes freeze in New Hampshire, the loons move to the ocean and they can keep fishing and doing what they like to do. And insects, there are insects that have a similar pattern rather than making a multi-thousand mile trip all at one throw. There are insects like um, the green darner, Anax junius, which is a dragonfly. Um, they're very common on Napa trees starting about now. And Anax junius makes little hops down the coast all during the fall, laying eggs in the ponds that they come to as they go. The Anax junius uh, preferred habitat is a weedy pond, a still pond like this. Um, and here's a, a, a larva of a uh, green darner. Uh, they're a horrifying thing if you're a small organism living in a pond. Um, dragonflies have, dragonfly larvae have these underslung jaws that they can like shoot out and grab stuff and pull it in. Um, and they can also fill their abdomens with water and jet along to chase stuff. So they're really horrifying. But, but they get eaten by fish. 
And uh, the uh, breeding success of uh, green darners is about 90% better when they're in fish-free ponds. And research has shown that female green darners aren't very good at detecting fish in the pond. So they can't tell when they're laying eggs whether there are fish in the pond or not. So their strategy is to lay eggs in as many ponds as they can as they go along. And this way, there's a good chance that some of them, at least, will, um, will succeed. And they go, to, um, they go down to the Gulf Coast, where uh, they are able to spend the winter. They uh, lay eggs in all those wetlands on the Gulf Coast. And when those uh, adults hatch out, they fly all the way back to the northeast, to our area, at one throw. When they get here, they actually meet some green darners that have overwintered. They didn't quite get big enough to emerge in the fall, so they just decided to, to hang out here for the winter in, a, in the pond. So it, genetic testing has shown that it is a single population of green darners. It's not two separate species, one migratory and one stationary. It just has to do with the timing of their, um, of their fattening up and their departure. But it's a strategy related to kind of their, their biology and their preferred habitat. And there's, there are comet darners, which you may see. They have the, the red abdomens. You may see those there. These are our biggest dragonflies. Both of these fatten up on mosquitoes here as adults before they head out. So uh, like the, they're probably out there competing with the bats and probably dodging bats. Um, and uh, Napa tree is very important. Um, now, some people want to know, how do we know that these insects migrate? And for monarchs, there have been tagging um, experiments you've probably read about. People put little numbered tags, and then they find them in Mexico, and you know where they came from. Uh, but some of the smaller insects you can't tag. And so there's some new technology where they analyze stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen and um, some other elements. And the ratio of the two different isotopes of uh, elements tells you the temperature at which the organism fed, essentially. So there's a different ratio of isotopes in the north versus in the south. So if you catch a green darner in the south and it has northern isotope ratios, you know that it's migrated down there. And this is going to become more important as we get towards the end, I'll show you. Now there's another dragonfly that's migratory and occurs here, the wandering glider. The wandering gliders migration is actually a global species. It occurs not only in the Atlantic, but also in the Indian Ocean. Um, and it's essentially a global species. It's a single species. It's not different populations. And this migration has been worked out in the Indian Ocean, where they leave India on the northeast winds, seasonal winds, and they travel across the islands of the Indian Ocean um, until they come to the coast of Africa, where they try and find a habitat to lay eggs in, a little pool to lay eggs in. And then the, uh, the new adults that hatch from that ride the monsoon winds back to India. And you can see thousands of these out to sea. Or when they come ashore on Block Island a few years ago, these are all wandering gliders. And again, this is an organism that has a very specific habitat requirement. You're, you're in the Indian Ocean. You're on the African coast. You're looking for a little wet spot. They're going to be very widely distributed, few and far between. So your best strategy is this kind of mobility. And again, here you see they're hopping, hop, 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 hop. And then they go jump all the way back and all at once. Here's the pattern. Um, th this is a reverse. This is some make a big jump south, and then they hippie hop their way back to the north. And here are two butterflies that migrate through Napa Tree Point that have this pattern. So this is the painted lady butterfly and the red admiral. And um, this pattern was worked out in Africa uh, and Europe, but it's the same pattern in North America, uh, same butterfly. Uh, these Butterflies, they fly all the way to West Africa in the fall, where they lay a generation of adults that make their way in a series of generations back. Each time they get to a fresh, flowery spring place as spring moves to the north, they lay a new generation that has caterpillars, and then that adult, those adults fly further north. And then at the right time, they fatten up, 
and they fly all the way back and start the cycle again. And these, one of the things, the, uh, the Red Admiral is interesting. Red Admiral um, food, the Red Admiral food plant is nettle. And nettle patches, when you find one, there's a patch, but they are few and far between. So again, it's probably a strategy related to a widely dispersed um, resource. And um, in case you think I'm making this up, this is Avondale Farm. And in this picture, there are eight painted ladies. And they're fattening up on goldenrod, just like they are out on Napa tree starting soon, so that they can make their big jump to the, south, to the southern United States um, and be able to keep finding the right resource, keep the, need, the resources they need. Right, so we talked about the, the stinging nettle and, and the red admirals. And, and these, the red admiral also has overwintering um, individuals that stay here, but it's not two species. They just, ha just has to do with the timing of getting going. And there are two other butterflies, the cloudless sulfur and the buckeye. I, th I, I think the buckeye is one of the prettiest butterflies we have. People think tropical butterflies are beautiful, but we've got a, a humdinger here. This is the, the buckeye. And these are migratory, and they move, they fatten up here. Buckeyes you'll start to see out in large numbers out on the beach um, shortly. There's a buckeye on seaside goldenrod on Napa tree. So it's, uh, it's on its way south. And I, I, I tried getting some, this is from iNaturalist. This is the distribution of buckeye sightings on iNaturalist. And you can see this coastal distribution, and here's Napa tree right here. This is not a butterfly that's commonly seen um, far inland, but it, you know, these, are the, these are the fall records. You can see them on the coast moving south. And this is the cloudless sulfur, which used to be a, a life find, but they're becoming more common up here um, with climate change. And if you see a very large uh, butterfly, the color of a tennis ball, about this time of year or maybe a little later, they fly super fast. They're not at all a fluttery kind of butterfly. Um, it's a giant salt, it's a cloudless sulfur, giant cloudless sulfur, and they migrate up and down the coast, right through Napa tree. And here's the um, autumn finds of, of iNaturalist, and you can see this coastal distribution, and here's Napa tree right in the middle of it. And so monarchs, you know, I started off by saying that monarchs are kind of, are, they're a little different. They do this big point-to-point uh, -point migration. But in fact, if you look at the timing of milkweed emergence, the movement of, my, of monarchs back to the north actually tracks the, the, uh, the sprouting of milkweed. The darker the green, the later the milkweed sprout uh, is. And you can see that it's, earliest here and latest here, and those are the monarchs moving back to the north. Um, they need to find milkweed that is in just the right stage for their caterpillars. It's got, it's, it's still soft enough for the little caterpillars to get their teeth into, but it's mature enough that it's developed the glycosides that are going to give those caterpillars their, their distasteful flavor that's going to help protect them. So here's another organism, another insect migrator that's Develop a strategy that's around a resource that has a wide distribution but specific timing. And I said you're gonna you're gonna want to know about stable isotopes at the end. These are two. These are a fly that's migratory. This is a surfid fly, and um, uh, the genus Aristalis, and they migrate through um, Napa tree too. And what is their resource that's few and far between, or has a cer very certain timing. Um, oh, no. no, they no, they eat. They both eat aphids, oh. <laughs> and so the, there's the apple tree aphid, and the aphids are only out and plump when the apple leaves are young, and the aphids can get um, a lot of juice from them. And the surfid fly follows the timing of the nice juicy apple tree aphids and the fresh leaves from the apple trees. And, and this is the pattern where they take a big jump, fall comes, they're like, we're out. We, this, is, this is not going to work for us. And they go to the south, they go as far south as they need to go to find some nice, plump, juicy aphids. And then their generations work their way back as the aphids become available to them. And so, the, and so the, I, 
I think that the insects, if you think about them as, as essentially having a special adaptation that uh, to these widely dispersed, essentially rare resources, you realize how important Napa tree is. All of these insects Napa, uh, uh, migrate through Napa tree. Think how disappointed you would be if you were a fly this big and you got to Napa tree and it wasn't here and it didn't have all these resources for you. Um, your whole strategy has been built around, around coming through here. And that's, th and that's why it's important to conserve Napa tree and keep it healthy. So, for the flies. <laughs> Thank you.